There it goes. That was easy. Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Two Crime Uncork. Today, I'm speaking with special guest Stephen David Lampley. Stephen is a 21-year veteran police officer, undercover sex crimes, SVU detective, and the only officer that's ever convinced the serial killer, known as the Claremont Killer, to come in to the police station to turn himself in. Some of the cases he's worked on, you can watch on shows like New Detectives on Discovery, Murder in the Afternoon on True TV, Unusual Suspects on ID, and of course, everyone's favorite, America's Most Wanted on Fox. He is also an accomplished author with books that include Jeffrey Dahmer and the, one of the most talked about serial killers, and the story of Kathy Jones, which is what we're going to talk about today, and he's become a friend. So, Stephen, thank you and welcome to the show. Listen, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I take every opportunity to talk about Kathy uh, that I can get. And, and being on your show is really an honor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you came on. Um, you know, I, I interviewed you a couple months ago on this case. And it was the first time I'd heard about it. And and I was told, go look her up. So I went and looked it up and I was immediately drawn. And then interviewing with her, you can't help but fall in love with this little girl. And um and I'm in the link below, there will be on YouTube, there's going to be a link for the book on Amazon and it's 12 and murdered. And, um, this book, I don't think you're even taking proceeds off this book. Are you Stephen? I'm, I'm refusing all royalties. The only yeah. reason that there's a price on the book is that, you know, the, the publisher wants to make money and so does the retail store. So I'm, you, I'm not making you a penny have to on pay this. for the paper and the ink that went right. into it and those kind of right. things. It's, um, I think on Amazon, it comes to a little over five bucks. Yeah. So order it, read it, share it. I buy one for uh, when I bought mine, I bought a couple and then I had a friend buy one and an extra. And then I sent two out this week. So well, get the book, so send it out. People read it. It's, it's not a hard read. It's, I mean, I read it in like two days. So, um, but Kathy was 12 years old. It's an old case. This was in 1969, Stephen. Yes. In um, right by Nashville, in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, murdered on her way to go to the skating rink. And um, so, tell us a little bit. How did you find this case, Stephen? Brandy, it's a little, it's a little weird, uh, and I don't mean to go uh, Twilight Zone here on your well, you on your, radio, say, on your with podcast. True crime, it's always Twilight Zone. <laughs> But it's it's really, and I, I'm I'm a very logical, very matter of fact. Show me the proof. Show me the evidence. Type of guy. Okay, uh, but I wasn't looking for. I didn't even know about Kathy. I had no idea who Kathy Jones was. Uh, I was actually investigating another case for another book, uh, a cold case back in 1934. Wow. Actually, back many 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 decades ago. And on uh, Dorothy Ann Disselhurst, who was also abducted uh, and murdered there in Nashville as well. And I was doing one of many, many, many searches online. And nowhere, nowhere in my search did I mention Jones, Kathy Jones. It was strictly a search on Dorothy Ann Disselhurst. Uh, and when I did that search on down uh, several, uh, I guess, search results was an uh, entry that mentioned a little girl named Kathy Jones. And everything above and below that was Dorothy Ann Disselhurst. I'm like, where did this come from? Did this girl know? And at the time, I didn't know anything about Kathy. I'm thinking, did this girl know Dorothy Ann? And then I clicked on the link and realized, no, this, was, this girl was born in 1957. They didn't know each. There was no. There's no connection except they both lived in Nashville. Now, what's even more strange, and some people have told me, well, when you search like that, you get similar things. I get that, uh, but what <laughs> what's even more amazing is that during that time frame, there were several other murders: uh, the Trimble case, uh, the Laprez case. There's several other child murders. None of those came up. Wow. Just Kathy's. And when I read that about Kathy, what the little bit I saw on that on that uh, search result, it really it's one of the. You ever get to hear a song on the radio and you can't get it out of your mind? You just keep mm -hmm. humming it. 
that was like, that's what Kathy's case did to me. I couldn't get it out of my mind. So I printed out, I'm old school. I'm an old school detective. <laughs> I like my paper in my file folders. So I printed out the, the few sheets that was on that, put it in a file folder, labeled it and set it aside. Cause I was in the middle of Dorothy and Dusselhurst, which I'll, I'll say, by the way, even though the case was in 1934 on Dorothy and Dusselhurst, uh, we were able to come up with a brand new suspect oh, in that wow. case that we, oh, did, we didn't know before. So, Cold cases may be cold, but there's never an ending to them. Right. Uh, and they're solvable. They're still solvable. They are. They are. Just got to be at the right place, right time, right evidence, uh, everything. The stars have to line up sometimes. I read somewhere the other day, somebody was talking about cold cases, and they said it's not that they aren't solvable. It's that the technology hasn't, when it, technology wasn't there. So when the technology sure. catches up with the crime, you solve the case. Exactly. Well, I... When I finished Dorothy and Disselhurst's book and I, and I finished the investigation, did all I could possibly do. We're still trying to identify the suspect. Uh, that may or may not happen. Uh, but I went, I started clearing off my desk. And if you've ever seen an author's desk, it's piled with papers around the floor, or the, the desktop and stuff hanging on the walls. Uh, I have and that I, problem and, and I'm not an author. <laughs> <laughs> I had actually forgotten to be honest. I had actually forgotten about uh, the file folder. And as I was putting everything away on Dorothy's case, I came across the file. Well, I started looking into it, and I went online and started looking more into it. Uh, and it became intriguing as, as, as I got more into it is that she and I were only a, were only a few months apart in age. Wow. And we lived about 10 miles from each other. Oh, and wow. Of course, of course, I was, you know, she was 12, I was 11. I wasn't watching the news. Okay. I was playing right. and doing other things. So, but I don't remember that, but then we played outside and we're normal kids. Yeah. And I, of course I didn't remember hearing about it, but had I watched the news, I would have, but anyway, there has been a series of events that's happened. Uh, not just with me, but with my uh, chief investigator, who's helping me investigate in Nashville, things that's happened that you just can't, explain and again i'm not trying to get all twilight zone ish yeah. but this somebody told me and I, and I sort of i sort of agree somebody told me uh matter of fact i've had two different people that don't even know each other tell me that steve you were supposed to find this case there's no doubt about it that was there uh i believe we all have a divine appointment with different things in life so and, um, and, and I, Kathy has grabbed me from day one, and it's one of those, she would have been way older than me. I mean, I was born in 72, so she would have been older than me, and I would have probably never met her, never mm -hmm. met her. I mean, I'm in Texas. She was in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and but as a mother, she has had my heart from the moment I read her story, and I have cried so many tears over this little girl that I've never met, you know, and the just the life that she had and what was taken away is just a baby as a child. What she didn't have that most of us had, we took for granted. Yeah. Yeah. She, and, you know, her, she just breaks my heart. It's a sad, it's a sad case. Not just in the fact that, I mean, it's obviously horrible that she was abducted, raped, tortured and, and murdered, but beyond being before that, it was a hard life for the little girl. It really was. And she tried desperately based on the witnesses that, that I've talked to and, and, and the family members, uh, the little girl tried really, really hard to have a normal life. She really did. They were um, a dirt poor family, weren't they? Just not really any money. Yeah, um, they she didn't was, have she a lot. She born premature. She was. Uh, even, and then in the book, I say, you know, she, from the very beginning upon her birth, it was tough for her. She, she never caught a break much. Uh, she was born premature. She was born uh, with a lazy eye, uh, and she had to have some surgeries due to her prematurity. And it just never, she just never had the life that a little child should have. Right. Picked on in school and those kinds of things. Yeah. She, the one thing that comes to my mind with her, there was a little girl when I was in school, was about fourth grade, third, fourth grade. Her name was Tabitha, dirt poor. They smelled, they didn't have soap, their clothes were gross. Everybody picked on her, even the teachers picked on her. And wow. um, this was back when corporal punishment was allowed. 
and the teacher had spanked her and we were changing out for PE and she had bruises on her rear end like this covered her whole butt and I said you need to tell your mama you know because I mean I would have told my mama my mama towards school up and she said my mama ain't gonna do nothing we don't have a way up here and who was she, she was she, what is she gonna do we're poor and I went oh hold on I'll call my mama I told my mother my mother got to the school the next day she called the sheriff and said I'm headed to the school you better meet me there because you're fixing to have to arrest me and she pulled that teacher in and she told her if you ever lay another finger on that little girl I swear to you God and this sheriff standing right here I will hurt you she never messed with the little girl again but we would take her clothes and soap laundry soap things like that they didn't have anything and they were so badly picked on and with this story I've always thought where's Tabitha did she have yeah. an ending like Kathy's because I don't know I moved from there I, I you know way before technology so I don't know how to find her sure. I've always wondered if she had the same kind of life or if she managed to do something you know with life despite her circumstances and I think Kathy would have I think Kathy from from what you've said about Kathy in the book she is that she was a glass half full kind of little girl just do life just be happy put a smile on i mean she didn't have anybody and was going to the the skating rink you know yeah. most kids would have been terrified to go to the skating rink because everybody picked on them you know not kathy she was going <laughs> and, and <laughs> you know, i love that kathy, about her. kathy was demure uh she was quiet uh one of the ladies one of the one of her classmates that i spoke to uh, that sat right next to Kathy. Um, Kathy was sitting, uh, for instance, here. She was sitting immediately to Kathy's left. And, uh, of course, they passed notes like kids do in class and whispered and, and talked. And uh, wow. And, and Kathy would go from one place to another, like to the bathroom, and she always had her head down. She, she was always down as if she was uh, sad or depressed or, uh, or both, perhaps. But Kathy had a little spunk about her as well. Uh, <laughs> she lived her life, I guess, in, in solitude for the most part because she didn't have many friends. Uh, she didn't go out to play much with other, with other kids. Most kids avoided her because she was poor. She had a lazy eye. Um, but Kathy had that little spark in her. And, and I discovered that when I, when I came across a conversation uh, somebody told me a conversation that she had with her mom and her stepdad. She might have been quiet and demure, but she had a little, she had a little toot about her. She wasn't afraid <laughs> so to I, stand up to some people, huh? No, no. <laughs> so I, I believe that Kathy, you know, this is just me speaking. I believe that had Kathy survived and not been abducted and murdered, Kathy would have been somebody, uh, she wouldn't have been just that kid, you know, uh, I don't I really know how to say this. Difference. She would have made something of herself. Yeah. She would have made a difference somewhere. She would have, she would have made a difference. That's just what yeah. I, what I feel when I, when I even think about Kathy, if she would have made a difference. Yeah. And um, so tell us about her, her home life. What was home life like for Kathy? It, uh, it wasn't, she tried to make the best of it. Like I said, she, she tried uh, again, they didn't have much financially. Then I was told by someone very close that there were times that there wasn't even really enough food uh, to eat. So it was it was a tough situation. Uh, information that I received also said that there were some very, uh, the word that they used to me was unscrupulous people coming and going from her house uh, at all hours. She, uh, again, she didn't have many friends. The only friends that she... I, I call them friends. I, they're not friends in the sense that you would go hang out with them at any time. They were just mainly, I would call them maybe acquaintances at school right. that you go to school, see, go home, you don't see until you go back to school. So Kathy spent a lot of time uh, in her bedroom with the door closed, singing uh, to the radio and dancing. That's what Kathy did for the most part. Uh, she did like to go. She loved skating was, was one of the things that she really loved to do. Uh, but the little girl never, ever owned her own skates up until, uh, the day she died. Actually, she never, ever was able to own her own skates, had to, you know, come up with the money to rent them. If she got to go at all, it was just really a, uh, it was really tough life for little Kathy. I just can't, can't imagine, you know, kids, 
today, most children, I mean, there are some families out there that don't have much. Most mm -hmm. children take things for granted. And, and I can look back on my childhood. I mean, I was the youngest of six kids, but they were grown. So I was an only child, but I never would have thought scraping the money to go to the skate and rink to rent the skates to skate would be a big deal or even yeah. the money to get a donut sure. was that big of a deal. And, and that was for Kathy, you know, coming up with 50 cents to go get a donut or whatever was probably, it was a big deal. Work. <laughs> it was a big deal. You know, I you mean, know, it was today a big deal was getting an iPhone back then. Right? A big deal was getting a donut, you know, <laughs> when, when am I getting a tablet? You know, I mean, <laughs> God forbid you take a cell phone at nine, you know, it's crazy. It's, my kids are like, we didn't get cell phones because I want my grandson to have a phone. Well, we didn't have cell phones. I'm like, well, because we didn't have cell phones when y'all were little. <laughs> it's a different world. But um, with Kathy, her parents had been divorced for quite a while, hadn't they? It hadn't been that long. Uh, okay. It hadn't been a, a long time. Um, and uh, the, the her, her biological dad ended up moving out because there was some infidelity uh, involved in the relationship. He ended up moving out and moving to Clarksville, Tennessee, uh, which is about an hour's drive northwest. Of, I lived in uh, Clarksville when we were at Fort Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I did. Yeah, I was at Fort Campbell. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was about an I hour's love drive. That area. So pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, her, her uh, I guess her mom's boyfriend at that time moved in, and there was a lot of. Uh, a great deal of animosity uh, between Kathy and her stepdad. Kathy made no bones. Again, I told you she had a little toot about her, a little 12 year old toot. Uh, Kathy made no bones. She was not quiet about the fact she didn't like her mom's boyfriend. There was mm. no doubt. There was no question whatsoever. Kathy didn't like it. Do we know why? Why? Uh, according to what Kathy, according to the information I received about what Kathy said, she felt like that he came in between her and her dad, her mm -hmm. mom and her dad. Uh, so he wanted, she wanted him gone. And at some point I was told she actually said this in front of her mom to her mom in front of her mom's boyfriend. So like oh. I said, she's got this, she got this little toot going on. <laughs> uh, Good for her. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that uh, he, he did move in and, and uh, at, at, uh, at some point. I don't know exactly when. I, I'm not able to track that time frame down, but it wasn't long after uh, her biological dad moved out. And they had a lot of different, lot of different um, nefarious type of people in and out, didn't they? They did. Kind of hanging they around. And uh, the information, the more information that I've received, there was a grocery, excuse me, a, a, not a grocery store in that sense, a market, if you will, maybe a mom and pop store that wasn't too far from the house where a lot of other unscrupulous people uh, would go hang out, drink beer. And, and a lot of the neighborhood kids that I talked to said they weren't allowed to go to this place, to the store oh. for candy, nothing, because it was apparently well known in the neighborhood. Kids, you don't, it's a bad place. You don't go there. Uh, mm -hmm. now I don't know how, how many of the people that were at the market went to Kathy's or vice versa. Uh, but also in my, and let, let me, let me back up. I, I don't okay. want to, I don't want to dog out Woodbine. Woodbine is an amazing area of Nashville. It really is. Uh, it's gone, it's gone over some changes since the 1960s. Um, a lot of the houses that were there, especially on Nolensville road, all those are gone now. So it's made some 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 amazing changes, but Woodbine back in the day, according to a lady, a girl that lived there, uh, or a lady actually that lived there, said Woodbine was the quintessential community. You had your hairdresser, you had your butcher, you had every you know you knew where to go to get this stuff, and everybody knew each other. It was like a close knit community. Uh, but you also have to, and I say this in the book, you have to understand. And this is true, not just with Woodbine, but this is true with virtually anywhere in the country, uh, possibly anywhere in the world. Uh, in the 1960s, we, we, it was a different time. It was a different place. It's a different era, different mindset. There were things that you just didn't talk about. Right. Uh, right. You didn't mention anything about child crime. It's like, oh, no, we, we, don't, we don't want to talk about it. No, no, shh. Uh, 
Yeah, being um, attacked, um, sexually attacked in any way was, you just didn't. Yeah, that was didn't the site. It was shameful. It was almost shameful. Mm -hmm. So in during my during my investigation in, into Kathy's case, I, I don't know how many times uh, I heard uh, somebody tell me, uh, Steve or Mister Lampley, whatever. Uh, I've never told anybody this before. I've heard that so many times, and. So when I, before I finally realized and the light went on in my head as to why, then that I would ask, well, why have you not told him? Well back, well, back then we didn't talk about it. So that's when I realized, oh, you're right. That was a different time, different place. We didn't talk about those things. Right. So I have had, uh, during the course of this investigation, I have actually uncovered three rapes that were never reported. Of course, Ty Ty, the uh, statute of limitations has long since passed on those. Of children uh, or young adults? Uh, uh, adults. Adults. Okay. Okay. Um, I forgot where I was going. Uh, the rapes, the rapes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then also was given. Of course, I couldn't put these names in the book, but I've had two individuals tell me of. And these were. There's, I'm not trying to be sexist or, or stereotype, but this is this is what they told me, and they were all males. So I, when I say they were men, they were, there were no female names given to me. Uh, there were several male names given to me that lived in or very close to the neighborhood that were supposedly known. Uh, I'll use a decent term called child lovers, uh, pedophiles, offending pedophiles type. Uh, and I do have those names, but of course I can't put them in the book. And right, I won't. Right. Um, but yeah, Woodbine was a very happy neighborhood kids went out and played they went skating like kathy they went to the new Krispy cream donut that had only been there like two or three four months i don't know hadn't been there long less than a year and they rode their bikes and they stayed out till sunset till those till the street lights came on they went home uh, but all that changed all that changed on november 29th 1969. i imagine that woke that that little town up and scarred them yeah but it did. And it, the people I've talked to said it changed everything. It changed their way of life. It changed their, their mentality on, on, on their safety, it, it, their, whether they were safe in their own community. It had a drastic effect on the families and children of Woodbine. It did. I can't imagine. I, I mean, we grew up in an area. I mean, I grew up way out in the country, left the house. The sun come up. I was out the door. I didn't come home till dark and all yeah. over the place and it was a tourist area it was on the lake and so you had people in the summer that came in that didn't normally live there but we didn't nobody worried about anything no mm -mm. i mean i wouldn't do that now i've been out there the last couple of years there's no way i mean i wouldn't even walk <laughs> and go not, not without the dog or a gun one or the other because it's just not safe <laughs> and it's sad that times have gone that way to where our children can't be safe playing in their yards anymore sometimes i mean it's just it's yeah. scary and i don't know why we've gotten that way i don't understand it i just well don't. i worked for a period of time undercover online uh if any of your listeners or viewers have ever seen to catch a predator uh i did that for a short period of time as a police officer uh and in, in doing that and all the things that were involved in portraying myself uh, as a 14-year-old girl, uh, learning about society and learning about the culture involved in that, uh, and some people may disagree with me, but the Internet has done a lot. Yes. Uh it's a scary place. Toward, toward this end, yeah. Uh, it has is, it is just opened up the floodgates of child pornography. Uh, child predators are online. Uh, thousands of them, this is no joke, thousands of them at any time are online mm. profiling children. I'm not talking about one or two. I've said thousands. Tens, actually, tens of thousands are online at any one time looking for children, and not just in our country. 
That's uh, just insanely scary. And I'm not saying the internet's bad. That's not what I'm saying. The internet's a wonderful tool, but the internet has opened up the avenue for a lot of pedophiles and child uh, molesters and predators uh, to do their craft, I guess, if you will. It's in it. I mean, it's, you've got, we have to teach our children. I mean, and it's sad that you have to have those conversations with your children. I mean, and I guess it, some of it began, became very open with Adam Walsh when he was taken. Because I can remember at that time, still kind of running around playing in the store, doing whatever, going down the road. And my mom had to have the talk. Somebody besides me is trying to get you. You scream, holler, kick, scratch. And that wasn't a conversation we ever had to have before that. Sure. And, sure. and now it is the whole online persona of who you're talking to may not be who you're talking to. Yeah, you can be anybody you want to be online. You can be, and that's why, I mean, even with a lot of the social media outlets, people are mean and vicious. And it's like, how old are you? Are you 12? I mean, why are you acting this way? Because they can. They can get away with it. They can act like fools and attack and be mean and ugly and get away with it because there's no repercussion because you're – you know, 2000 miles away. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, there's the a story. I don't remember the story. The uh, one that convinced the young girl, I read it here a while back. It was a teenage girl. I think she was 14 and they were having an online relationship and he convinced her to leave out and he got her. She got a bike and went away city over and he picked her up and took her off and they almost didn't find her. And he kept her in like a dog kennel. I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm the links that people go to to convince these children sure to do the to, to leave home to take themselves out of their safety net and and mm -hmm. and some of them don't make it back home you know, you know have a, have, have a have that conversation of sex trafficking people don't understand it happens everywhere every city it's happening well, yeah it is and, and when i go crazy. speak to students sometimes or, or to parents I get very, I get very frustrated, and I'm laughing because it's just I just can't believe that I'm hearing what I'm hearing from some of these people, is that oh well, our, we only have four thousand people in our town. That won't happen here. Don't count on it. I, sometimes I just want to turn, like walk away. Yeah, you know, this can't. You can't be saying that. Not only can it, if it hasn't yet, it will, or it has at some point. See, so, I I arrested. When I worked undercover, and this is one of this is one of the thing the points I make when I talk to children and, and adults, is that when I was working undercover, I wasn't working undercover in a big city. I was working undercover in a town with a population of less than fifteen hundred people. Wow. Okay. Now I was online talking to this I hate to use the word gentleman, but I'll say gentleman, uh, pervert online. And, I like that uh, one better. <laughs> let me also tell you before I get into this, this, this particular case, I started out portraying myself as a 14 year old girl. Uh, and that is a, a tremendous learning curve for an adult male because <laughs> you have to learn, They're crazy. <laughs> you know, I had to learn how not to look like the, the pervert when I went to the store to see what the latest styles were. I needed to know that. I needed to know that blue jean shorts or pink shorts or white. I needed to know that. Right. Uh, I needed to know the lingo. I needed to know the acronyms that they were using when they text and type. I needed to know the music that they were listening to, the foods that they liked. It was a, it was a huge learning curve. Uh, but that's how I started. Now, as I began talking to these pedophiles, offending or not, some of them, or most of them, I'll say, would get to the point, some later than earlier than others, would get to the point they would say, hey, why don't you turn your camera on let me see your breasts or see you nude or whatever. Mm. All right, well, I don't know how other state laws read, but the state I was in, when that happens, that's what we call the attempted production of child pornography. Oh. So they're asking for this to be produced so that became a felony that became a federal crime in addition to a state crime. Uh, and I brought in the feds and what we ended up doing was I ended up creating another profile where I was a, I think I was 34 or 36. I can't remember year old father. Mama was the 
chief income producer for our family. She left and ran away. We don't know where she is. Now, this, of course, is, is fiction. And I had right. a 10 year old, I had a 10 year old daughter now because we weren't making ends meet again. I'll say this is fiction. I don't want people. Right. Everybody is angry. telling what he this did. This is okay. totally <laughs> fiction. Okay. <laughs> this is only, only an undercover operation. I was to be a 34 year old single dad with a 10 year old daughter and we were having it tough financially. So what I was fictionally doing was renting my daughter out. And people do that. Um, people do that. Huh? And people do that. that. People do that. Oh, they do do that. Yeah. So uh, I came up with a screen name oh, that was that was not suggestive, but yet maybe it was. It was Dad W Daughter. Dad with daughter. That's all mm. I said. I was not going to sex chat rooms. I went into just general everyday conversation chat rooms. I wasn't trying to lead them. It could have very well said dad with dog, dad with car. It just happened to say dad with daughter. Right. Right. And uh, this particular person responded with, and this is a very short conversation. Some of these conversations can go on for days. This one lasted actually one day. Uh, he said, interesting screen name. What does it mean? I don't know. What do you think it means? You tell me. Uh, so we went through this whole conversation and I, he said, uh, we, we got to the point of the fact that he realized that I was renting my daughter out and, uh, he was on his way on. He was on his way to meet me. He was about four hours away. He said, I'm on my way. I'll meet you at this convenience store where I told him, I'll, let's meet at this convenience store. If you're legit, then you can follow me to my house. Anyway. I'll cut out all the other investigative stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, to say that he showed up with the money, with the candy that I said my fictitious daughter liked and the, and the drinks, the, the sodas that I told him that she liked showed up with all of that. He was placed under arrest, five felony counts on my end. We took him to the police department. He admitted without even being questioned that he was there to meet a girl, an uh, underage girl, ran him through the computer. And this, this is, this is no joke because his case, the, uh, Alabama district attorney's office, or excuse me, Alabama attorney general's office contacted me and they wanted to prosecute the case. That's how bad it was. Wow. And I said, I said, certainly you can by all means, because you have, you know, we're, if they can get this guy in federal prison, there's no good time. He'll do every day in feds. So anyway, go back to the police department, run through the computer. No exaggeration whatsoever. I'm not making any of this up or, or padding it. He was wanted for 900 counts of possession of child pornography and uh, sexual assault on children. Nine hundred. It's a nine zero zero. Yes, ma'am. That's that's wow. uh, out of Canada, Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, so he is. Uh, and and I, why did I say that? As I was talking a little bit ago about it can happen anywhere. This town had a population of under fifteen hundred people, and this international fugitive from justice came to that town thinking he was going to have sex with one of the ten year old residents there. So I don't ever want to hear anybody tell me it can't happen here. So have you written a book about some of these? I wrote a book called I was the girl. Okay. Uh, that outlines some of the operations and how I did it. Uh, some of the background, uh, have to get that how, it, how it developed. Uh, and I'm very honored. Also, some of your listeners or you probably know, uh, the name Alicia Kozakiewicz, mm -hmm. uh, she is, she has become a very good friend of mine. She, of course, she's on the other end of the spectrum of, of the child predator thing. Cause she was abducted and quite honestly was probably based on what the FBI said and, and the offender who was holding her, she was probably just a few hours away from being murdered before they, before they uh, rescued her out of his basement. I would love to uh, call her and interview her. She's a, she's a remarkable lady. She really is. She's a remarkable woman, very strong, very independent, very, uh, very knowledgeable. And she does, she goes out of her way to protect children. Uh, she gives seminars, of course has books. Um, excuse me. I don't think she has books. She has seminars and videos, what I meant. 
Remarkable lady. Remarkable lady. I respect her immensely. But yeah, uh, yeah back in her on. I would love to talk with her. I I, I want to make sure I advocate for victims of all spectrums. And children mm -hmm. to me are even more because a lot of these children don't have anybody to fight. Okay, I think you didn't have anybody else to fight for her. Mm -mm. You know, I don't think no. her family fought for her. I just don't feel that they did. They may have, and I could be wrong. I just don't feel as a mother that Kathy's mama did what she should have done. And that, but that's my opinion on, on watching some of this and are reading some of this about her. Yeah. I don't, uh, I've always taken a position to, and I guess this comes from my mama when I was young. If you can't say nice, something nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. But <laughs> I in, tried to do that, but it didn't work. <laughs> in my investigations and, and, and listening to some of the interviews uh, back when her mom was living uh, and reading some of the uh, papers and, and the stuff that I've seen, I'm having a hard time meshing fact with reality on some of it. Um, of course, I can't go back and interview a lot of these right. people because they're, they're, they're deceased now. And a strange thing, and I'm not, I'm not making any implication here, but all of Kathy's family, with the exception of a couple, died very early. Her mom died of cancer in her 40s. Uh, her brother committed suicide when he was young. Uh, she has a surviving brother, but it was just a, it's just a tragic case. Um, but anyway, I, I can't go back and talk, but there's some, there's some things that I've come across on it. And okay, how could that happen if this, you know, mm -hmm. so there's some discrepancies that I'm, that I'm looking at. Right. Right. So let's talk about the day that Kathy come up missing. Okay. Um, that was what day after Thanksgiving, wasn't it? It was uh, actually two days after it was days. Thanksgiving was on a Thursday and this was Saturday. Uh, Kathy, um, Kathy was doing her usual thing. She was, uh, in her room listening to music and dancing and, and doing her usual Kathy thing. Her aunt and cousin came over and her aunt had bought her cousin a new pair of skates. Well, logically they wanted Kathy to have the older skates and they weren't run. They weren't from what I, what I've been told, they weren't run down. They weren't bad. They were just used still in very good shape. So they decided they would drive over and give them to Kathy. So they drove over to Kathy's house and Kathy, I don't want to, I don't want to <clears throat> go off here. Uh, Kathy was so excited. It was like the, it was like the grandest thing she had ever gotten in her life. She was so happy. She imagine was dancing. that smile on her face. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, she was just beside herself, just a happy, happy little 12-year-old uh, girl. Uh, they left, and, and the, her, her mom and her went about their business. Well, she asked her mom if it was something she could do around the house to earn money to go skating. First, she, you know, you get, a, you, get, you get a new pair of skates, you want to use them. You know, you want to go show them <laughs> off. So her mom said yes, if, you know, and she did some stuff around the house, and she earned a dollar. Now, a dollar doesn't sound like much, but when you're, when you're talking about 1969, uh, I went back and looked at skating rink to get in the skating rink was 55 cents. So she had 55 cents. She had 45 cents left over to get God knows how many donuts you could get in 69 for 45 cents. So she was going to stop by Krispy Kreme on her way and get her a donut or two. And then she was going to go skating. Uh, she left her house. Uh, she, first of all, she put, she put a sweater on. She, she had a, she apparently didn't have any pants or anything along. So she wore a dress, put on a sweater and a coat to stay warm, uh, grabbed her purse and her skates and proceeded out the door and said, my mom, I'll, I'll see you later. She said, well, call me when she supposedly said, call me when you're finished. I'll come pick you up. So, so why did mama drive her to the skating rink? Supposedly, Kathy, according to the information now, this is not from Kathy. Supposedly, Kathy wanted to walk so her brothers wouldn't know she was going skating and be followed. Uh, now, okay. so I, I don't know. That's, that's what I'm told. Uh, point. But you have to, uh, also the story I was told, 
the information that I received in my investigation, this is the first time Kathy ever walked. It was a Saturday night. It was cold out. It was above freezing, but not much. Uh, and there's a whole nother story with that as she, as, as she would get closer to Krispy Kreme. But she left the house at 745, walked out the front door, and walked west on Ludy Street, which is the street she lived on. She got is probably about halfway, maybe three quarters of the way down Ludy Street, turned left and cut across the back lot of the fire station. Now, what I'm what I mean by back lot, let me explain so everybody knows. A lot of fire departments don't have access to the back of their property, which means that when they respond to a fire, the fire trucks have to pull out front and back in to the fire department and be ready for another fire. Well, this particular fire station had the advantage of owning the property from uh, the street that they were on over to Ludy Street, which meant that when they responded to a fire, they could simply pull behind the fire department over the uh, asphalt and into the fire department and be ready to go out the front the next call. Okay? Oh, okay. So she cut across the back lot on Ludy Street of the fire department, sort of at an angle, uh, past the fire department to the front. And we know this because there were two firefighters that were sitting out front that night and saw her. So we know she made it to the fire department. She then made a right sort of a sort of right angle and headed to the corner where the, uh, I forget the owner's name, but it was a CB grocery store. She sort of cut across the parking lot there and went over to the red light there. Uh, supposedly to cross the street, which I think she would have chosen to cross the street there rather than walk all the way down to Thompson Lane, which was a huge, huge, busy intersection. So uh, by the fact that she was standing there waiting indicates that she was waiting to cross the street. Mm -hmm. That's the last time she was ever seen alive. Now, the theory is, and my theory is, is that she walked south on the Nolan, on Nolansville Road, on the western margin of the sidewalk, headed toward Krispy Kreme. And there's a couple of there's a couple of rule uh, schools of thought on that, and I don't know which one that I ascribe to yet because I don't really have any evidence uh, one way or the other. Is that Kathy either proceeded all the way down Nolansville Road, turned right on Thompson Lane and was going to go to the Krispy Kreme store that way. The other theory is that she didn't go all the way down to Thompson Lane. She stopped and turned right on a little street called McLean and then turned left on Grandview, which was on the other side of Krispy Kreme and was going to go to Krispy Kreme that way. Now, my problem with the McLean theory is that there were no street lights at that time in that back area. It was in the mid thirties, mid to upper thirties at that time. It was dark. Kathy was, again, she was demure, like I said a while ago, quiet, uh, skittish, if you will. I don't know that I see her cutting across that. Right, she would have stayed with the lights or there I was think, Yeah, I think so. The only thing, safe. yeah, the only thing to make me think different is that I, I spoke with one of the girls who knew her, who went to school with her, and Saturday afternoon, which is which has not been apparently not been uncovered before because I'm not seeing it in in any news media or any accounts whatsoever. But one of the girls she went to school with also skated. So Kathy, after she got her skates, at some point walked down to the McLean area back behind Krispy Kreme to this girl's house to ask her if she was going skating. And the girl said, no, I've been grounded. And then supposedly Kathy went back home. So apparently at some point, Kathy was at least familiar with that area. So that does give credence to the fact that, well, maybe she did cut across there. Uh, but at any point, that was the last time she was seen was when she was standing at the red light uh, about to cross Nolansville Road. Mm. So she never made it into the skating rink. She never made it, apparently never made it to the Krispy Kreme or the skating rink because the dollar that she had was still in her coat pocket. So, you know, she I don't obviously understand had not how nobody saw somebody grab her. That just, I 
guess I don't know. People, I don't guess people pay as much attention as they need to. Well, I'm having real trouble with the fact that nobody saw her. It was Saturday night, and and you had to. I have some experience. There have been people out everywhere. That's a busy yeah. time. See, my dad. Uh, we lived in Nashville. We lived in Gallatin. My dad was killed when I was nine. Now, he was buried in Woodlawn Cemetery, uh, on Thompson Lane, just down from Krispy Kreme. So. I know what Thompson Lane and Nullisville Road was like because we would go visit my dad's grave. We lived in Madison at that time. We had moved to Madison, and that was sort of the way you went. We'd come down Thompson Lane. My my uncle had a grocery store there on Nolansville. So I'm sort of familiar. That was a busy road. I just can't think that or believe that somebody didn't see something. And in, and in the process of this, I'll, I'll go back. We talked a little bit ago about Nolensville Road and the houses were now gone. In uh, a map that I got from NASA, God bless NASA, uh, <laughs> it, shows a, it shows a series of eight houses still on Nolensville Road between McLean and Thompson Lane. Uh, now, some of those houses were abandoned. Some were still being lived in. We are in the process now of trying to identify who lived in those houses uh, and try to reach them to see if there's anything they know. Uh, Hail Mary pass, right? Okay. Right. I but mean, you, it never hurts. You you got it. You you check everything. You don't leave anything. Right. So, uh, yeah, we're 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 working on that, and there's several other things we're working on. Mm. And so, um, when was she reported missing? Well, her mom, this is her mom allegedly, uh, Kathy didn't come home at the time this getting ring supposedly closed. And her mom told her, like, like I said, to call her. Well, she didn't receive a phone call. So her mom allegedly gets in a car and goes to the skating rink and realizes the skating rink's closed and Kathy's nowhere to be found. So she goes back and calls the police at that time. The police respond. They come out and talk to the mom. And initially, the theory was, well, maybe she met up with a, with a quote, little boyfriend, unquote. Uh, her mom said no. She was not. Uh, that, that wasn't Kathy. She was not at that age, like perfumes and cosmetics, and she wasn't into the boy thing. Uh, so she was reported just a few hours after that. But let me back up on that. In, in the media and in the reports, she said that Kathy was not into the, the cosmetics and the perfume and then the boy, you know, liking boys. But yet what I have discovered in my investigation is that that's not totally true. Because supposedly from what I, information I've been given, Kathy kept a, a, one or more packets of perfume of Avon in her purse. So there was at least a little bit of interest <laughs> or Kathy wouldn't have carried around these packets of Avon, the little wipes, I guess they are. Right. Well, they used to have the little bitty tubes, sample tubes of the perfume. <coughs> they had so, the wipes and they had the little perfume bottles. Yeah. Supposedly she had the little wipes. Um, okay. Okay. So that's, of course, that that's not really a deal breaker as far as who murdered Kathy, but it is right. interesting that we would, that uh, her mom did not know that. And I, I just, it's just one of those questions I want to find an answer to. I, you know, I don't know. I would think every mom would know. You would think. Yeah. I mean, my girls at that age had the lip glosses and the little perfumes yeah. Yeah. and they wanted all of that. I mean, whether they use it or not, they just had them in the purse. Yeah. My middle daughter would have, 500 pins in her purse. <laughs> she would think about pins. And, but they always had a lip gloss and a perfume in their purses. Yes, I'm, I'm not trying to implicate mom. I'm just saying that there's it's some weird. information it's that I'm getting weird. two stories on, and I, I need to clarify that. You know, somehow. Right. It's just a little weird. It's odd. It's odd. Yeah. And another thing that I was told by a family member is that and, and this individual, I won't say male or female, is that this individual questioned how mom would go pick up Kathy because her car wasn't working. 
Now right. that doesn't mean right. she I didn't. I almost forgot about that because the car was supposed to be broken. Yeah. But that doesn't mean she didn't. That doesn't mean that she didn't. She couldn't borrow a neighbor's car. That doesn't mean that she couldn't have her sister come pick her up and take her. Uh, it's just that the words that were used, I will come and get you. Uh, and in fact, her car was broken. Okay, well, who, if, if your car is broken, how did you go? Who went with you? Uh, who knows that you borrowed their car? There's some more information I need there too. So, Right, and so they didn't get that kind of information. They didn't, no. I don't guess they looked at the family at all in this? Oh, no, they did. They did. Okay. Uh, please, let me also say, and in the book, one of the very first pages in the book is, I am in no way, shape, form, or fashion, saying that the Nashville Police Department didn't do everything they could. No, no, no. The Nashville Police Department, in my opinion, is probably one of the best police departments in this country, period. No, no exceptions. They're one of the best. Uh, but I, I was a police officer for 21 years, and I understand the budget constraints. When you get to a point that you can no longer, there are no longer any leads, uh, nothing else to investigate. You've investigated all you can. You have to move on. You do. You have. Right. It's just, you know, you just can't sit at the desk and wait for somebody to call on this case. You have to move on other cases. Uh, and well, and, and these cases sit with these officers. I mean, I, oh, I have, you know, yeah. I've listened to a few talk about different cold cases and they're like, that one got me. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't solve it. And that, that set with me, you know? Yeah. And so, I mean, I don't ever fault them. I just always wonder no, no. why certain things weren't asked or was it overlooked or, you know, so I don't know. It, and you also have to understand that even though, they don't say, for instance, the police department doesn't say, well, we spoke to this person. Doesn't mean they didn't. Right. True. Or just because they say, this is how we found the body. Doesn't mean that's all they found. They right. hold back some information that well, only that's the what, offender would know. I was explaining to somebody the other day about a cold case and they were like, well, they won't give me the records. I'm like, they're not going to give you the records. It's a cold mm -hmm. case. It's open. Mm -hmm. They cannot give no. you that information. They can't no. because they've got stuff in there that's going to identify a killer or sure, an abductor sure. or whatever the, the, the perpetrator is that if they give that out, then they know they have it. So why it's, they're not, it's not and, until uh, that case is closed. You can't get that information. You know, me as a police officer, if I was still a police officer and had a reason to have the file, they would share it with me. If I had, if I had a bona fide reason to need it, but I'm not a police officer anymore. So they're, they're, you know, they're not going to share it with me. And I get that. I totally get that. Uh, so part of the problem that, that I've come across in this case is that I believe that I have uncovered information that they probably don't have. I believe I have, I can't, I don't know that because I'm not seeing the file, but in doing this, if I uncover stuff that they, excuse me, don't know about what, how can I say this? I can't, I don't need to be releasing that, but I don't know what they know what they don't. So I'm having to walk a fine line on what I find out, what I can tell, what I can't. Cause I don't, I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe they know this, maybe. Th so it's this, that little paper thin trail right. I'm having to walk on. Cause right. I don't want to release something they have that they're holding back. Right. Oh, I can imagine. We don't, yeah, we definitely don't want, don't want to tip nobody off. I mean, no, no, it, it, and hurt an investigation at that. I mean, that's the thing. You don't want to hurt the investigation. No. Um, and so Kathy was found on Tuesday, wasn't it? Yes. Uh -huh. Just uh, at 12.10 in the afternoon uh, by a civil defense worker, sergeant. Um, okay, this is tough. It, and I'm going to warn everybody that's watching. I I know what's fixing to come. I know details because I've read it and I've heard Stephen talk about it. And this is very graphic. And um, feel free to hit fast forward if it's too much. And uh, it's this is the I, I've told people when I've when I've sent the book and I've talked to them. I'm like grab tissues. This case is rough. This little girl, what she went through. God. God help the person that did it. God help yeah, them. Yeah, if there are children, you might want to excuse them. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, from this conversation, if if you don't like hearing things, you probably want to 
probably give me a couple of minutes and come back. Uh, Kathy was found in a weeded field immediately behind Krispy Kreme donuts. It was cold, overcast. She was, uh, <clears throat> she was found completely nude except for one sock. Her body was in this contortionist position. Her head was back. Her back was arched. One of her legs was semi under her body. Uh, she had a series of small cuts on her. She was black and blue from being beaten and bruised. She had some kind of black uh, substance under at least one of her hands and her fingernails that appeared to be the kind of residue you would find on tar paper. Um, she had bluish green fibers on her and she had a drop of blood on her stomach that was ruled not to be hers. Her eyes were open and she, they, they figured out she had been there. And you have to understand also decomposition was immensely slowed because it was cold. Right. Um, so there's two schools of thought is that she was there, uh, not, not too long after she was abducted. Uh, there's also a school of thought that she was dumped there Monday. Um, and they're just not sure which of those two. Right. Uh, one one of the officers, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the investigators says that he believes she was there the whole time, uh, which may be true because the composition again was slowed immensely by the uh, by the, the temperature. And the grass but was the, pretty high. It was. It was waist high. Yeah. Now there was a lady, and I've I've spoken to this lady's. I believe it was her niece. Uh, we have located a lot of people on this case. We've had people that say, hey, have you talked to so-and-so? No, well, let me get them to talk to you. It's been amazing the the outpouring of people that have come forward, and it's just amazing. So, But I, I talked to, I think it was the niece of the lady that lived less than 20 feet from where Kathy was found. She was an elderly lady. Uh, I mean, she was. I think she was in her 80s. And she had a burn, excuse me, she had a burn barrel that was less than 20 feet from where Kathy was found. The house, of course, was farther out. Uh, and they asked her if they heard, if she heard anything or she, she didn't hear. I don't know if she had trouble hearing and missed it. I don't know if she just didn't hear anything. I don't know if there was nothing to hear. Uh, but she said she heard nothing. Um, but on the, con on the flip side of that, I spoke to a couple of people. And one, one of these ladies I believe it was her mother who worked at Krispy Kreme on Saturday. I think it was Saturday night. They heard a cat screeching outside and you know, you don't pay much attention to a cat screeching, but was it really a cat screeching or was, or was that a 12 year old girl screeching? screaming? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Oh. Uh, but that was on a Saturday night. Um, uh, Another thing related to this case that's interesting is that when Kathy was abducted, they, of course, when they found her, she had been tied up. Uh, they had cut strips of the inside lining of her coat and, and used that to tie her up. They didn't use rope they brought. Uh, they, the sock that was off of her foot had been cut in half and stuffed in her mouth. So they brought nothing to silence her with. They took her blouse and tied it around her mouth to keep the sock in place. They brought nothing with them. And and most, most most of these predators have gear, for lack of a better word, for what they're going to do. Yeah. So given that this person, now you have to understand there's so many variables. There's so many possibilities. But when you're looking at what happened and you're looking at the evidence, you have to try to come up with some kind of theory on why, you know, why did this person not use rope and duct tape? Uh, well, obviously they probably didn't bring it or maybe they brought it and forgot. Who knows? 
nonetheless, it was they used the lining of her coat to tie her with. So I have to wonder if this individual, if this was random. I don't think it was random because this is the first time she had ever walked to the skating rink. So this was not a pattern. It was not somebody waiting on her. Yes, okay, it could have been random, could have been a transient. <clears throat> uh, Most people that are watching and waiting for a victim of any type to show up already have what they need to subdue the victim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that uh, would make me think that this wasn't random. No, uh, I don't believe it was random. I, I really don't. Um, now, when you're thinking about the fact that she, she was abducted, murdered, uh, tortured and murdered. If it was somebody that knew her or was close to the family, that would make sense. And I'm, I'm trying to be careful on what I say here because there's a reason. Uh, let me go back. Okay. Let me go back to to the Saturday afternoon, Kathy was at home with her mom and picked up the phone and called her biological dad and lived in Clarksville. Now this comes from her dad. This is the interview I heard. Uh, of course, her dad's deceased, but this comes from a recorded interview that I heard on her dad. So this is fact, according to what he says, <clears throat> she tried to call him that Saturday afternoon. And there was something that she, in, in his words, she really wanted to tell me it's really, really urgent. There's something she had to tell me about what was going on. Well, apparently he was busy and couldn't talk and told her, he said, hun, listen, I'm, I'm busy, whatever the conversation was. You know, we'll have to talk about this another time. Just call me back. Well, of course, she never got the chance to call him back. So one of the theories is what was she trying? What was she wanting to tell him? We do know, and this is fact, this is evidenced by police records, that there was some uh, shoplifting activity going on. Uh, with the stepdad, uh, apparently there was some some routine shoplifting going on where they would shoplift and return the merchandise for money. Uh, was she trying to tell her dad that one of the uh, one of her classmates told me that, and she told me with great sincerity on the phone. She says, "Steve, listen, you, you know." Sometimes you get a hunch, you just get a feeling about something. She said, I don't have any proof of this. I have no proof. I never saw anything on Kathy, but something about Kathy, something about the way she, who she was and the way she carried herself just led me to believe she was being molested. Now there's no proof of that anywhere. So if, but let's, let's assume that was true. Who was molesting Kathy? Where, you know, all these questions come up. Was that something maybe she was going to tell her dad? Uh, now, given the fact that she made this phone call to her dad, did the person responsible for any of this get wind of it? Now, this is Saturday afternoon. Get wind of it at the last minute and realize, oh, no, hell, oh, hell no, hell, you're not. You're not turning me in. And then at the spur of the moment, wait on her knowing that she was going to walk, given the fact that she was close to the family somehow and knew that she was going, got new skates and was walking, waited on her. And then that's another theory. Uh, she was badly sexually assaulted during this attack. Wasn't she? Yes. Yes. She was uh, raped and sodomized repeatedly. Yes. Uh, and your listeners need to, <laughs> I might want to give a little warning here. Give me about 30 seconds and come back. Uh, I'll give you time to go away. <laughs> uh, she was raped so badly that it mimicked an episiotomy. That's how, that's how horribly bad she was treated. Uh, that's the damage that it caused her. Now you have to, under, have to, that is just, it's unfathomable. I, it is. It. I just, I cannot wrap my, and I've read the book. I, I can't wrap my mind about that. You know. That her whole attack just seems very personal, very um, angry. Yes. 
very angry in the attack. And I know we've seen that in a lot of different cases where the victim is getting the brunt of whatever the perpetrator's issue is, you know, yeah, yeah. and but and so there's something here with this one, but we don't see any other crimes like that in the area. To, Not like to, mim like to, to say a serial person doing this. Yeah. So, I mean, this was way brutal, way brutal. Yeah, there was an immense amount of anger involved, which is an indicator, yeah. which is which is evidence in and of itself. Uh, the fact that there was an immense amount of anger uh, and perhaps retaliation uh, for something, and which which sends me back to the fact that did she know something that she was about to tell? Right. Yeah. yeah. Just. You know, for a little girl that never had anything, if one day she gets something that means so much to her, yeah. she doesn't get to enjoy it, it's taken from her. And never got to use the skates. And she so never got to, and never got to get the donut. She no. still had the dollar in her pocket. Yeah. So she never even made it to the donut shop to get a dang donut. No, she and didn't. Just, I just can't, I can't understand it. I do not. This, these stories are what make me hurt my hope in humanity because why a 12 year old little girl with that kind of anger? I mean, this, this isn't a crime of passion. This is anger. Mm -hmm. Brutality. It's just, just disgusting. It's just it's definitely, oh. it's definitely, and I hate to use the word overkill, but it's, it you know, is you very can kill somebody, overkill. but you can really go overboard. This is overboard. right. I mean, this There's was of, this after the after the sexual attack. There would have been an easier way to kill her to not be so overkill. I mean, it, it just mm -hmm. yeah. The police officers and investigators that were on the scene, uh, all of the ones that. Uh, or a lot of them, I won't say all of them, a lot of them said this was probably the worst crime scene they'd ever seen in their life. I would, this would, this would definitely scar me if it was something I had to investigate. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine the innocence of a 12 year old. I mean, yeah. you can look at an adult woman and say, well, she was seeing so-and-so and she knew this and she knew that. And you can kind of categorize. It's never right, but you can categorize. Oh. This was an innocent baby. Mm -hmm. Innocent. There's nothing out there that would ever say Kathy was, could have been the perpetrator of anything. She was innocent. Yeah. And, and it just, this would have, if I would have been an investigator for this, this would have changed my life completely and not for the good. I don't know how, you come back from this kind of case. You know, as a police officer in the academy, at least in my academy, uh, they made it very plain, very clear. Two things. Number one, you don't get involved. Number two, you never show emotion. I don't know how many times that I have bit the inside of my right cheek. I probably, I'll be all, all honesty. I probably have scars. <laughs> I know at times it bled. I do know that because uh, I, yeah, it's it's tough. It's uh, but probably why I never went into the field. Because, you have to that learn. Because it's, it's something I've always been interested in. I would have loved doing it. I'm too emotional, and I don't know that, <laughs> that I could hold back. I just. I don't know how you take this this case and look at this little girl in that field, in that position, in that condition, and not get personal. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know. know. You know, just investigating it from what I've done, there are many, I don't know, many times I've had tears running down my cheeks as I was writing the book or looking at her. <clears throat> it's, looking it's at hard. her picture, looking at her picture. I cried many times in the book. I mean, I would have to put it down, compose myself, clean my face and start again because it was. And, and even with the other stories that you have in the book, they're very touching. But Kathy's 
this little baby angel, she deserves some justice yeah. somehow. She deserves it. She didn't have anything else in her life. She deserves it. Yeah. You know, and what's what's really everything about this is sad. But and when, when I was talking about her a while ago, talking about uh, her life she had at home, Kathy never had new clothing. Everything the girl, at least as far as I can tell and I've been told, every piece of clothing the girl ever owned was a hand-me-down. Panties, dress, coats, everything was hand-me-down. She never, ever knew uh, what it was like to go to a store and buy a new blouse or buy socks or shoes. You can imagine a little girl not ever having new panties. No. There's a I mean, story... There's a story let that, that, that set in people, new panties. She never had new no. panties. There's a story I'm told by one of her classmates that said that one time she went into the bathroom and Kathy was already in the bathroom, already in there. And there were some other girls. I don't know how many. There were some other girls in the bathroom. <clears throat> when this particular girl walked in, they had Kathy's dress pulled up, was pointing and laughing at the holes in her panties. Um, uh, and see, and I'd have been in the office in trouble for beating the crap out of kids because I was that one <laughs> in school that took up for the little girls like yeah. Kathy. I just couldn't. Well, shame on she, them. Shame on them. When she was when she was uh, at her funeral, she had a real pretty little. I can't remember if it was gray or maroon. I don't remember, but it was like it was like a velvet type style. Really, mm -hmm. really pretty. Uh, had uh, tan lace around the borders. Uh, she had a, a brooch that they bought her and, and around her neck. And what's really sad, it has to be sad, but happy. Yeah, she, she that was a new dress, but that's the first new piece of clothing she ever wore was at her funeral. And that'll hit you. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, that gets me that never got anything new till the day she was buried yeah. and just she, she never knew what it was like to wear new. you you know uh it's just a sad it's just a sad case and i let me say this i know i've probably talked long enough i could talk <laughs> i could talk all week uh if there's anybody any of your listeners that knows anything uh, let me back up a little bit also and say a lot of times in cases that we in law enforcement work, it's sometimes depending on just a little tidbit of information. It's sometimes just the smallest little bit of information. And a lot of people think, well, that's not important. I won't tell them. But you know what? That's just exactly the thing we're looking for. That's that little piece on that puzzle. When you put a puzzle together, yeah. every yeah. little piece matters. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an end piece or a corner. Maybe it's an inside. That one Anything. little piece that they know completely will blow the case wide open. <laughs> it will, will mm -hmm. blow. Uh, for instance, there was a, there was a time a lady said, uh, talk to a lady. She said, well, well, I, I have some information, but it's not going to do you any good. I said, well, what do you have? She said, well, I, I got a partial tag number. Oh, my. What do you, oh my, I'm like, oh, <laughs> what do you well, have? And she said, well, I only got the first, I think, two or three. That's the corner piece of that puzzle, dang it. Bingo. <laughs> we got the, sus we, we have a vehicle. And right. she says, well, how? I said, I said well, we have a, we have a, we have a system, computer system. We can go in there and enter that partial tag number with the make and model, if you, even if you don't know that, and the color. And we, yeah, we may get a list with, with a thousand cars that match that. But that's a starting point. Now we've narrowed and then you our match suspect, those cars right? for the area, and then you go down to about two hundred, and then you just yeah. keep. So that even up. the even if you think what you have is not important, please, <laughs> please, even I'm not laughing because it's funny. In the description on how to contact him and get him the info so that he can do his job with this case. I will make sure everything is in the description, and um, and I will share. I will keep sharing this story. Um. I mean, wasn't there also some allegations about some of the boys from the school attacking one of the other girls? Uh, like convincing her to leave off or something like that. Yeah, there, there was another lady that I talked to. 
uh, who was also a student, who was, uh, I got to be careful how I say this, uh, who was approached by a classmate and, and asked her, why don't we go to the pharmacy and get a milkshake? Back then, the pharmacies, you, you went there and then oh, sure. sodas. <laughs> yeah, that's where you got your food and your, you know, your, your milkshakes. And she said, oh, okay. So they head off uh, to the pharmacy, supposedly. Uh, and then this boy changes course. Instead of going one way, he goes the other way. She says, well, the pharmacy's this way. She says, he says, well, let's just go down here for a minute. I got something I need to do. Then we'll go. Uh, little did she know that he had been paid $20 by an adult, well, actually an older, older teenager from another school to bring her to this field, which was not far from the school, the other school. And he raped her. Oh, wow. Uh, uh now s- supposedly he has been cleared, uh, in Kathy's case. And I say supposedly because I haven't cleared him yet. I'm not saying that they haven't done right, but yet, let me tell you something else. When I do, when I do a cold case, especially since I'm no longer a police officer and don't have privy to the, to the files, I don't want to see the case file. I don't want to see the police reports. I don't want to it read didn't it. prejudice you against what you're looking at. Right. I don't want to look at something and then think, okay, well in the report, they said, I don't want to know that. I want to, I want to do my own thing as best I can. And then at some point when I've exhausted and I'm far away from exhausting, when I've exhausted all my leads, then I'll, you know, contact the investigator at that time and say, okay, this is, can I meet? Let me show you what I have. You don't have to show me what you have. Let me show you what I have. Uh, and before I began this investigation into Kathy, I sent a two page letter to the cold case unit uh, explaining to them, okay, my name is, this is who I am. I'm not some crackpot just wants to get in and stick his nose. I want to help. This is what I'm going to, I want to investigate her case. I'm not here to step on your toes or anything, but I want you to know who I am in, in case my name comes across your desk and it probably will at some time. Somebody will say, Hey, who is this? Uh, I just wanted them to be aware. Uh, they have done, the detectives over the years have been assigned to this case have done a, a wonderful job uh, at this. Nothing Whatever I'm happened doing. to the stepdad? He ended up being murdered in a oh. drug deal. Uh, I forget the name. It was over. I forget the street. I have it written down, but I can't remember the name of the street. He was a passenger in a van, uh, supposedly in the middle of a drug deal. Uh, he was with a, a younger female driver. She was out of the van, out of the van at the time, and another male approached her stepdad, shot him in one of his legs. Uh, he died from that. I'm assuming he must have shot the femoral artery or something for Probably that to happen. Probably hit the artery. Yeah. So literally everybody in Kathy's close circle, mom, dad, what about her siblings? But everybody else is dead. She has one brother. Uh, but we've not been able to get much information. Uh, and I sort of, you know, sometimes you just want to leave the past in the past. Uh, but all her other family is, is deceased. Makes it even harder. Makes yeah. this even harder. Fortunately, there are recordings of interviews and I will also want to give a huge shout out to Olivia Lind, uh, who did the, uh, flat rock, podcast series oh, on yes. Kathy. Uh, she has, I have contacted her and she's answered all my questions about things. I didn't know. Uh, she's a superb woman, a superb podcast. On they did, that that is Kathy. an all, awesome, awesome uh, podcast on Kathy. Yeah. So they I want to thank her as well. But yeah, if there's anything, you know, anything, I don't care how unimportant you think it may be, or maybe you think we already know it. I don't, I don't care to hear it again because I may hear a different view. I may hear a different slant. It's like when I was in law enforcement, we'd say we, we would have a, uh, the, the, uh, the story is you have a wreck in the middle of a four way intersection. You're going to get, if there's somebody standing on each corner, you get a different, you get four different stories of the same thing. Right. So I want, if you have information about the case, even though I may have discussed part of it, call and tell me your version of it. Uh, because there may be one word in that that makes you go, oh, yeah, 
And so you just never know. I, I always tell everybody, just tell it, tell the story, tell what you need to tell. Uh, you just never know. If I'm working on another it. cold case in Ohio. It was my very first case I did. And um, I've told her when we get to go to trial on this one, I'll be there. I mean, we pretty much, we, we kind of think we know who did it. And, and this, of course, this one was with an officer who is now in jail because of his nefarious activity. And so yeah. it's very questionable. But um, I, I look forward to solving that case with her. And But I, I tell everybody when we talk about it, I'm like, anything, anything somebody has said, send it to us. Let us yeah. hear it. Let's put it together with the other 500 stories we have and see what part of that puzzle it's fitting and if we can actually get the truth no. for the victims. It's for the no. victims. In the end, it's for the victims. Yeah. Uh, I'll listen to the same story over and over because at some point, somebody, somebody knows you can't be at the same place at the same time. Physics says you can't be at the same place at the same time. So right. if somebody saw the same thing, they saw it from two different angles. They have two different perspectives. I want to hear it again. I want to hear it over and over. until I don't understand I how nobody yeah. saw her be taken. They're too busy. I just can't. Uh, and, and one of my, how can I say that? There are a couple of theories, two theories on how she could have been picked up that night and people didn't really pay attention to it. Uh, and I can't say why, uh, but I will say it wasn't by private vehicle. There's two incidents where, where she may have accepted a ride willingly Actually, thinking it was safe. Thinking it was safe, and it wasn't. And maybe not. Maybe somebody saw that and didn't think anything of it. Well, that's okay. that's fine. You know, that would so, make sense. That would make sense. But you would think and, now. Uh, that, I mean, you think something would make somebody go, "Oh, but wait." But. And 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 what's amazing about those two incidents that could have taken place? Each one involves one of my suspects. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think. You don't have suspects named in the book. So I'm like, wait, let me see where he was talking about who and what in this. <laughs> in, in one instance, she would have taken a ride from this individual willingly, or at least semi willingly, and nobody would have thought anything about it. That's one of my suspects. In another totally different circumstance, in a different kind of vehicle, she would have probably taken a ride willingly due to the circumstances. That's my other suspect. Hey, so we have stuff. Well, when you're able to name these suspects, you make sure to let me know. <laughs> I will. I will. Uh, uh, one's curious. deceased and one's living. We have one of those individuals is deceased, but we still have one. It's it's very. Well, much I have boring. I have I have my suspect, but you know, <laughs> I'm just a lay person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am too now. I'm I'm the reader of the book. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you buying the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for doing this. I love the book. I'm I'm working on the other one. I'm trying to get into the Dahmer book, but I've got so many books. Um, <laughs> and one of these days, you'll have a chance and we can talk Dahmer because he fascinates me to no end. <laughs> yeah, Dahmer was different than every other serial killer that's ever lived. Yes, he was just... And Kemper. Kemper's entertaining. Kemper is... I don't know much about man. him. To be honest, it, it's one I've just started looking into, but uh, Dahmer was one that caught my attention early on as a teenager that just was like, Wow, holy cow! So, yeah, I, I well, little I like note about Dahmer, and I, I know you didn't have me on to talk about Dahmer, but one little note about Dahmer is what some people don't realize. Uh, a lot of people, when I when I wrote the book about Dahmer, I kept hearing people say, oh, he got all of his uh, medical knowledge from the military. Oh, he was a medic and, and he, no, no, no. Because I was in the same medical program Dahmer was. I went through the same training Dahmer went. Matter of fact, I went through the same training that Jeffrey Dahmer went and the next course above. So Dahmer did not get any uh anatomical dissecting knowledge from any the of the serious what stuff so ever no. no no he just he's something he uh yeah. that, that was definitely something in the day that was like shocking more so than ever ted bundy was i mean people still yeah. talk about ted bundy in the way he just fit in normal life but he Palmer was 
he changed the rules on things. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but he was he was different than every other serial killer up to date. So, and we'll get a chance to do that at some point. Uh, you've got a full schedule and violin lessons and. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It's solving Kathy's case. We've got to solve this case and, and I will make sure everything will be in the description. Well, thank you and, so uh, much. And uh, so if you know anything, I don't care if it was the color of somebody's shirt. Let him know anything, Please. anything else. We, you know, Kathy deserves it. This needs to be for Kathy. Yes. That little baby girl deserves so much. And so she was failed all of her life. Let's not fail her after her death. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, but any, thank anything. you, Stephen. And, and if you don't want to talk to me by phone, I've actually had one person to contact me that didn't want to talk by telephone. They wanted to meet one-on-one. -on -one. I'll drive to Nashville. I don't care. Or wherever you want to meet, uh, just, just contact me, please. Absolutely. Please do, everybody. Thank you so much. So, thank you, Stephen, so much. I've enjoyed it.